Okay. Sir, will you please start the recording? Yeah, I'll start. I'll start. Yeah, many have already joined, so let's start. Uh, others may join. Yeah. So, uh, what uh, basically I am going to discuss in today's class some insights relating to economics from Arthasastra. We'll have uh, two sessions, one by me and another one by uh, Professor N.C. Nayak, who will be taking the other session on Wednesday, that is on 27th. And then uh, we can have another session jointly by both of us, where we can have discussions on the related issues, and we can cover the rest of the things, if, if anything is uh, required. Uh, so in this class, I have thought of basically covering a few aspects uh, from the perspective of Arthasastra, what insights we get from Arthasastra, and how we can relate those insights to uh, the contemporary discussions and theories in economics. So basically linking the insights from Arthasastra to the contemporary economic theories and practices. This is basically the perspective uh, that we are going to uh, discuss about in today's class. And Professor Nayak uh, would be uh, discussing more on uh, resource conservation, uh, some aspects of public finance, etc. Now, uh, if we talk about economics, if you see uh, textbooks that we study uh, nowadays, um, we basically start with understanding of certain aspects of an economy. Like we say that, uh, there are uh, limited resources available uh, in an economy. Those resources can be used for alternative purposes. And at the same time, we have uh, we, we have limited resources. We have unlimited ones. So on the one hand, we have limited resources that can be used for alternative purposes. On the other hand, we have unlimited ones that are competing in nature often. So we basically need to make a balance between the two. And for that, we need to make certain decisions relating to production process, consumption behavior, et cetera. There are certain questions that often we discuss in economics. Is say, for example, what to produce, how to produce, for whom to produce, et cetera. So limited resources, unlimited wants wants may be competing in nature the resources can be used for alternative purposes and then we subsequently discuss about consumption production distribution exchange that takes place in a market and then also we talk about the macroeconomic policies now given this background, let us uh, try to understand what basic insights we get about the various notions and concepts from Arthasastra. In, in Arthasastra, the discussions relating, relating to economics can be seen in combination with the perspective of philosophy, ethics, and politics. So in Arthasastra, the broad discussions on economics 
is not in isolation of the insights from philosophy, insights from ethics, insights from politics. Like what we say in today's context, that there are four factors of production, land, labor, capital, and organization. Similar discussions, similar mention we see in the Artha Shastra as well. And there also uh, uh, the discussions are centered around four basic means of production, like land, labor, capital, and organization, with land being the main source of wealth accumulation and which can be done by using labor. So, in Arthasastra, the primary focus is given on land, and this land is used by uh, uh, land is used in the production process through labor, and then output is produced, and then subsequent economic activities takes place. That was the basically uh, basic notion. Like what we see in, con in uh, various theories of economics, like the idea of the concept of demand, the concept of supply, similar ideas we see in the Artha Shastra as well. Uh, it was discussed that price shouldn't be fixed arbitrarily by the king or the state in isolation of demand and supply. Now, what we discussed today, suppose there is a competitive market. In a competitive market, there is a demand curve, which is negatively sloped. There is a supply curve, which is positively sloped. And the point of intersection of the demand and supply curve basically gives us the equilibrium price. And at this equilibrium price, we say that the consumers are in a position to maximize their utility. The firms, the producers are in a position to maximize their profit. So this is how we discuss the basic theory of market equilibrium in the textbooks. Demand curve, supply curve, intersection between the demand and supply curve, then we are getting equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. And as I say, I mean, this equilibrium price is basically maximizing utility of the consumers and maximizing a profit of the uh, farms, producers. And at this equilibrium price, actually objective of the consumers and objective of the farms that are made. So what this notion is about optimization of certain objective functions. Now what happens throughout the demand curve every point along the demand curve consumer's utility is maximum every point along the supply curve producer's profit is maximum but it is the point of equilibrium the point of intersection of the demand and supply curve where both utility of the consumer and profit of the producer both are maximized simultaneously so basically the conflict between the two sets of agents, the producers and the consumers, the conflicts are resolved at this point of equilibrium. The conflicting objectives. Now what happens? In Arthasastra, it is pointed out that the prices shouldn't be fixed arbitrarily by the state or by the king in isolation of demand and supply. Because 
arbitrary price fixing in isolation of demand and supply may result in deviation from the equilibrium. And in the process, welfare may not be maximized. So when price is fixed arbitrarily in isolation of demand and supply, there is a possibility that there would be deviation from equilibrium and in the process, welfare will not be maximized. And similar concept, similar idea was propounded by Adam Smith, what was called invisible hand. This concept of invisible hand is a very, very basic concept what we discuss in economics. So what Orthoshastra talks about price fixing, considering demand and supply, not by the state, not by the king, market forces basically deciding the price. Similar concept we see when we talk about invisible hand as it was propounded by Adam Smith. In Orthoshastra, we also see some concerns about the adverse impact of monopoly power. And if you talk about the current discussion on market, particularly in respect of competition, consumers' welfare, we talk about monopoly power. And there are various regulations, there are various laws that can regulate emergence of monopoly power or practicing monopoly power in a market. In, in Arthasastra, to address the problem of it was recommended that the profit limit shouldn't exceed, say, beyond 10%. Profit should be, the rate of profit should be allowed somewhere around 5 to 10%. Because if there is monopoly power, then, and, and if that monopoly power is exercised, price may go up, and in the process, consumers' welfare would be affected. So, what I'm saying here is that this concept of monopoly power is a very, very important issue in today's discussion on market, on competition, on welfare, etc. And similar discussions we see in Arthasastra as well. What is the concern of monopoly power? As I said, is basically in the context of exercising monopoly power and then affecting, exercising monopoly power by the farm, say for example, and affecting consumers' welfare in the process by charging higher price. I just bring in one aspect here. That is the concept of parity optimality that we discuss in economics. When you talk about welfare economics, the discussion often starts with the basic notion of parity optimality. And in case of parity optimality, there are certain conditions what we derive mathematically, and we say that these conditions can be satisfied if there is competition in the market. And to be very specific, when there is perfect competition in the market. 
So there are concerns about monopoly power. Of course, there are certain uh, research theories where it is said that monopoly power is not necessarily harmful for an economy. Question is, it is not a, it, it is not a question of monopoly power, rather it is a question of exercising monopoly power in charging prices, etc. But again, the concern was there, even in the discussion in Arthasastra, and as I said, uh, the profitability or the rate of profit up to say 10 percent was allowed to avoid the adverse impacts of monopoly power. Then uh, broad economic activities. The broad economic activities that Arthasastra talks about. It was agriculture, annual husbandry and trade. But the economic landscape in the discussion, the economic landscape was centered around agriculture. At the same time, it was recognized that knowledge of the king would be very, very important. Knowledge of the king about the national economy. When I talk about knowledge of the king, if I just link it to today's theories of economics, it is basically the state. So the, the king should have the knowledge, the ideas about the national economy, because that is very, very important to discharge the functions of the king successfully and efficiently. It was also emphasized on the fact that Accumulation of wealth would be very important. Accumulation of wealth in the form of metals, labor, forest produce, etc. Because this wealth would be subsequently used for the production process. And it was pointed out that agriculture and animal husbandry would be the basic sources of new wealth. Fire from surplus would be generated and new wealth would be accumulated. Now let us see parallelly the contemporary discussions about the role of wealth, wealth accumulation. Now when we talk about today's discussion uh, on macroeconomics, we talk about growth. And when we talk about growth, it basically comes from investment. And when we talk about investment, savings, it's, it's a basic source of investment in addition to borrowing, etc. So, the role of investment in the growth process of an economy is recognized. Investment is what? Basically change in the stock of capital. Change in the stock of capital, making investment in the process, and then facilitating growth of an economy. And saving is very, very important in that context. So the contemporary economic theories, particularly the macroeconomic theories and discussions talk about this. And similar discussions we see in Arthasastra where accumulation of wealth has been emphasized on. Because it is realized that wealth accumulation would be very, very important for growth and welfare. And in the context 
of that period, basically protecting people against famines. Now, what is the responsibility of the state and the community? So, Arthasastra talks about role of the king, role of the state, but at the same time, it also recognizes the responsibility of the community for development of agriculture. Particularly in case of resource conservation, etc. And it was pointed out that the valuation of land should be based on its fertility. At the same time, there should be effective regulation and settlement of disputes between the employers and the workers. Now, again, in contemporary discussion on economics also, we talk about enhancing fertility of land because land is given with growth of an economy, with de development taking place in the process, there is obvious transition from primary sector to secondary sector to tertiary sector. In the process, land is being converted for, farmland is being used for other purposes. So these are all obvious processes. Now, when large part of farmland is used for agriculture, then obviously there may be probably little less concern. But at the same time, when population growth takes place and a part of land is used for other purposes, then enhancing productivity of land is also very, very important. So as it was realized that valuing land based on its fertility, if we see today's context, emphasis is being given on enhancing the fertility of the land to increase the production process. I mean, basically to increase the production of agricultural produce. So, the insights what we get from Arthasastra and what we see the practice today, we see some degree of similarity, be it in terms of emphasis on wealth accumulation, be it in respect of using wealth for welfare of people, be it in respect of recognizing the role of the state and the community, in the development process, be it in respect of regulating wage and settling disputes when, when there are conflicts between the employers and the workers. Even in today's context also we see the how the disputes are resolved through negotiations between the management and the trade union and the other agents like the government. So, let us now move to the discussion on role of the state. So, what we discussed so far? We discussed about the basic concepts and the notions where we see some degree of similarity between what Arthasastra talks about and what we see in contemporary economic theories and practices. We also discussed about the economic activities. Again, there also we see some degree of similarities. Now we are talking about the role of the state. Now, Arthasastra also emphasized on role of the state in economic activities. 
And in today's context also, we see the role of the state. Of course, the role that the state plays today, its nature has changed, its form has changed, but role of the state continues in economic activities. Like say, uh, at one point of time, economic theories used to talk about role of the state in addressing the problem of market failures. producing goods and services that are not otherwise possible by the private enterprises. We have seen, say, for example, in Indian context, the importance of the public sector enterprises, particularly uh, from the second five-year plan onward, if we see emergence of public sector enterprises and strengthening the industrial base of the economy. So when we talk about public sector enterprises, basically the focus is on intervention of the state in the production process. We have also seen government facilitating green revolution to enhance production in agriculture sector through infrastructure development, bringing in modern technologies, etc. So, government's role can be seen in the production process. Government role can also be seen in the process of distribution, like public distribution system, basically uh, providing essential items to the people through the public distribution system. We can also see government's role in the process of development of infrastructure. Again, the role has changed definitely. Like at one point of time, government used to construct roads, bridges, etc. Government basically used to have presence, strong presence in development of infrastructure. Now, instead of government spending money for infrastructure purposes, in many cases we see public-private partnerships. So the nature of intervention of the government has changed, but again, role of the state is very much there. We can also see government's role in the regulation process. Basically, regulating various activities by economic agents in an economy. We see the basic discussion in public finance. Initially, it was said that the government should have important role to play in allocation of resources, because as I said, we have limited resources with alternative uses. So when we have limited resources with alternative uses, resource allocation is very, very important. And in, in today's discussion on public finance, it is said that government would have definitely important role in resource allocation, in distribution of goods and services, in controlling or bringing in macroeconomic stability. But at the same time, government's role is very, very important in technology development, development of infrastructure, development of market, information dissemination, etc. So, role of the state 
it was recognized in Arthasastra. And role of the state in economic activities is seen in contemporary economic theories and discussions also. Only there are some changes in the nature of the role of the state. The way the state or the government intervenes in economic activities. The form has changed, but role of the state is still very, very important in various economic activities. Involvement of the state in planning and implementation of policies, revenue collection, in judiciary process, various business activities. All were mentioned in Arthasastra. And we can see in many of these aspects, we can see significant role of the state. As I talked about existence of state controlled production and distribution system, like public sector enterprises, state controlled production system, and uh, distribution system like PDS. Again, participation of private businesses was also recognized and allowed in Arthasastra. And in today's economic world, also we see coexistence of both private and public sector enterprises. It was discussed in Arthasastra that if, if coexistence of state owned and private businesses raises any conflicts, then government should intervene into the process. There is a possibility that there may be some degree of conflicts. We have various regulatory structures various laws, norms, etc. Now, in Arthasastra, it was pointed out that state's intervention would be very, very important if there is overproduction, basically to avoid price slash. And similar concept we see when we talk about price flow. So price flow is a very, very important concept what we discuss in today's economics. It's a very important concept. Basically, to set a minimum price. And similar discussion, similar mentioning can be seen in Arthasastra as well. Then we are talking about the tax structure and the budgetary aspects. Yes, taxation, basically what was mentioned as Rajkar was the major source of revenue. Though the state had limited taxing power because excessive tax, it was recognized that excessive tax would cause adverse impact. I'll come to that discussion subsequently. The basic principle of taxation was that the tax structure should ensure that it is levied once in a year and based on the ability to pay so that it doesn't become burdensome for the taxpayers. It was also important to ensure that the tax structure is equitable and justified. Now, when we talk about today's, when we discuss about today's theory of taxation, we basically talk about two 
broad principles. One is ability to pay and another one is willingness to pay. And this reference of ability to pay is seen in Arthasastra as well. And of course, the major sources of tax revenue of the government differs widely between what was there uh, during that time and what we see the different areas of taxes and in today's context. In Arthasastra, it was pointed out that taxes and uh, or tax would be imposed on land, forest, properties, customs, like uh, profit of the state, factories, etc. Then uh, it was also pointed out that, as I said, that the tax rate shouldn't be too high. So the taxes, it should be, the tax structure should be designed in such a way that it's not heavy and it's not excessive to avoid the possible adverse impact of higher taxes on economic activities. So uh, I, I just refer one uh, concept here, what we discussed uh, when we talk about the theories of taxes and today we talk about Lafarca. And in this Lafarca beach, largely inverted you said, Along the horizontal axis, there is tax rate, and along the vertical axis, we measure total tax revenue of the government. And this inverted U shaped curve means is the, if the government raises tax rate, initially total tax revenue of the government increases, it reaches the optimum point, and then subsequently it declines. Because one of the possible reasons is that high tax rate also raises the possibility of tax evasion. So people would probably be more willing to pay the tax when the tax rate is low as compared to when the tax rate is high. And it may so happen that after a certain point, government's tax revenue, total tax revenue will go down even if the tax rate is increased. There are certain other explanations also. I'm not getting into that detail. I mean, why do we say that increase in tax rate will uh, result in lower tax revenue of the government subsequently? But one point is very, very important in this context is that Arthasastra recognizes this particular aspect. It was recognized in Arthasastra that high tax rate would cause adverse impact on economic activities. So it was recommended that the tax rate should be somewhere around one sixth or one fifth of the economic activities, somewhere around 16 to 20%. To avoid adverse impact on economic activities and also to avoid possible tax evasion. In macroeconomic context also we see if the tax rate, if the, say for example, if the income tax rate is increased, then there will be some adverse impact on growth. But at the same time, it was recommended that high tax rates should be imposed on harmful goods or services. Like as we see in today's context, higher tax rate being imposed on cigarettes, liquor, etc. So again, we see some similarities in the basic notion, the basic principles of taxation. One is taxation shouldn't be 
KB and Malaksan. Second, the principles of ability to pay and equity. And the third one is basically high rate of tax on harmful goods and services. If we discuss about contemporary theories on taxation, on public finance, we see high degree of similarities with these concepts, what we see in Arthasastra. Arthasastra also uh, pointed out about high rate of tax on import of luxurious goods, basically to discourage their imports and encourage their domestic production. And say, for example, in Indian context also, we have seen for long the policy of import substitution and export promotion. High import duties on various items so that imported items become expensive, imports are discouraged, and domestic production takes place in the process. Now, if we move to the next aspect, it is basically uh, the same continuation of tax structure and the budget, but basically on expenditure. In Arthasastra, concerns are raised about the expenditure side of the budget. And it was recommended to have surplus budget to avoid various crises. In particular, it was pointed out that aggregate waste bill shouldn't exceed one fourth of the total revenue of the state. And the major areas for public expenditure that was mentioned was public administration, defense, salaries of ministers and government employees, maintenance of national storehouses and granaries, acquisition of valuable ornaments, gems, precious stones, etc. These are the major areas that was recommended where public expenditure can take place. But at the same time, emphasis was given on protecting the weaker sections of the society and the aged people. It was also emphasized on providing employment opportunities to those who are unemployed. Arthasastra also talks about maintenance of sanitation facilities, prevention of fire, basically safety and security of people, public health, social production, etc. And in, in today's context also, if we see, we see various social security schemes, programs of the state government, of the central government. We also see various measures towards sanitation, drinking water, cleaner cooking fuels, better housing facilities. So, as I say, I mean, we see a lot of relevance of what economic theories we discuss today, what practices we follow, vis-a-vis -vis what was recommended or pointed out in Arthasastra. Like say, for example, it was mentioned that depositing the surplus amount in the treasury, basically for future use. At the same time, Arthasastra recognized the role of intelligence department and auditing process, robust auditing process to prevent economic offenses. In today's world also, we have audit system, we have intelligence department, 
various agencies of the government to prevent economic offenses. The last component is basically related to emphasis on international trade, which was highly, highly recognized in Arthasastra. It was recognized that international trade would be very important for promoting economic growth. Even it was pointed out that the state, the government can also intervene and participate in trading in certain cases. But what is very important is regulation and development of trade by the state. Importantly, it was recommended that incentives should be provided to counter higher risks and uncertainties. It was also recommended that higher profit rates should be allowed on imports. Of course, imports of essential items vis-a-vis -vis the domestic goods. Because at that point of time, there used to be incidences of robbery, etc. Uh, during shipments to, to incentivize the importers to counter against such incidences losses because of such incidences, it was recommended that higher rate of profit on imports of essential goods should be allowed. Basically, uh, this is again largely in the line of the profit theory of night, but basically says profit is the reward of uncertainty. So this uncertainty should be adequately captured. As regards rate of interest, it was pointed out that the rate of interest should be determined based on the risks involved and the productivity of capital. This is to some extent deviating from what often we used to see that the interest rates are determined by the state. Like in many countries, the rate of interest is determined by the central bank. But in Arthasastra, it was pointed out that it should be based on the risks involved and the productivity of capital. At the same time, higher interest rate was recommended for loans for business vis-a-vis -vis loan taken for various personal causes. Though it recognizes exemption from payments of interest on human considerations, particularly for those who are not in a position to pay, etc., which is similar to modern days borrowing and lending system. We see various exemptions, concessions that are given on different types of loans. Now, these are basically the broad areas where we see the discussions in Arthasastra and uh, the religions or the similarities what we see in today's economic theories and practices. But the important question here is, what are the major learning points? And how various aspects have changed over time. I think this is an important point where we should focus on. And now what basically I'm going to do, I'm basically pointing out the major learning insights from Arthasastra, what we can see with reference to contemporary economic theories and policies. The first one is basically recognition of the fact that 
resources are limited and wants are unlimited. So we have the problem of limited resources and unlimited wants. And when this is the case, there are two aspects that are very, very important. One is allocation of resources for the right purpose and distribution of goods and services. Because many may not be having the affordability. Now, what discussions we see in Arthasastra? In Arthasastra, it is recognized that state has an important role to play in the production process and also in the process of distribution. Like the important, the production of important items can be in the hand of the state and the rest can be left to the private enterprises. So some such arrangement was recognized in Arthasastra. Because Arthasastra emphasized on optimization of resources and its use. Second, Arthasastra recognizes the coexistence of private and state businesses. And if we talk about the contemporary discussions, we talk about three types of economic system. One is entirely driven by the market. Another is entirely state controlled. And the third one is basically a combination of the two. Where private businesses are allowed to operate, market forces are allowed to operate, but state has certain control or regulation. So what we see the arrangements, the system, economic system today, we can see its reference or link with what was discussed and recommended in Arthasastra. Again, as I said, role of the government has widened, the form has changed. It is no longer role of the government only in the production or distribution process. It has been widened to bring in stability in the economy, development of infrastructure. Again, in development of infrastructure, there is a change from government expenditure or investment to public private partnership. So the form has changed. It's a continuous process. So from that perspective, we see some differences, but the basic logic is that the state has an important role to play in, in development of some such facilities to facilitate production process and also to facilitate distribution of goods and services along with regulation of various government activities. I pointed out about the conflicts that when there is coexistence of state and private businesses, there is a potential conflict. And in that case, role of the state would be very, very important to, to resolve some such conflicts. Now, the fourth important aspect is basically various social security measures. 
we have seen where the government can spend, where the state can spend. Arthasastra talks about protecting the weaker sections, aged people, unemployed. And in today's context, we see various social security measures, various support systems of the government. Next, the taxation structure. When you talk about the tax structure that was pointed out in Arthasastra, and if we see today's tax structure, both talks about ability to pay. Of course, in contemporary discussions, we also talk about willingness to pay. But ability to pay, we see this, this notion we see in Arthasastra as well as in contemporary theories of taxes. And the difference is basically arises in context of willingness to pay. But the other very important common point is that the tax structure should be equitable. The adverse consequences of high rate of tax was recognized in Arthasastra. And in today's context also it is recognized. As I said, I mean, Lafarca, the concept of Lafarca is a classic example. And it is said that as the tax rate increases, initially the government's tax revenue may increase, but subsequently it will decrease. It will cause adverse impact on economic activities. Also, it will lead to evasion of tax. Government's tax revenue may go down. It may become burdensome for people. Again, if we see contemporary theories and Arthasastra, we see the common thread between the two in respect of emphasizing on high rate of tax on harmful goods and services like cigarettes, liquors, etc. If we see today, we see high rate of tax is imposed on such goods. Arthasastra also pointed out about the same. Basically, high rate of tax on harmful goods and services. Like, say, uh, another reference point high rate of tax on luxurious imported items. Such goods, imported luxurious goods, it was recommended to be imposed with high rate of tax basically to encourage domestic production. Because with high rate of tax, prices of those goods will go up and then consumers will switch over from such commodities to domestically produced uh, varieties. Now we have seen, even in Indian context, the policy of import substitution. So we see again some references in this context also. Then the other important aspect is the role of trade. Of course, if we see the recent discussions on economic growth, it doesn't focus only on trade, it also focuses on investment. But again, role of the trade is recognized. There are standard theories in economics, 
like say the theory of absolute advantage, the theory of comparative advantage. These theories discuss about the importance of trade and the gains from trade. Orthosastra recognized the role of international trade for economic prosperity. But only what has changed in today's context for economic prosperity along with international trade, emphasis is also being given on investment. For example, suppose a particular economy wants to strengthen its presence in the international market. So there may be two ways or rather three ways I would say. One way is basically through trade, through exports. Another is by making investment abroad. And the third one is basically a combination of the two. So only the scope has widened from trade to a combination of trade and investment. But in either case, role of international trade is recognized. Imports. There are two aspects what we see in Arthasastra. One is high rate of tax on imported luxurious goods. At the same time, allowing high rate of profit for the imported commodities, basically to in, in incentivize the importers against robbery during segments. Now, when we talk about some such imports, we are basically talking about imports of final goods, when we are talking about high rate of tax on imported goods. But at the same time, imports of various factors of production, it is recognized. Like import of technology, import of certain raw materials, import of certain capital goods. All are very, very important in the contemporary production process. And in many cases, the government incentivizes some such imports basically to facilitate domestic production. Even there is a difference in terms of, I mean, deviating from the policy of import substitution in today's context. In many cases, import of final goods are also, or they may also cause favorable impact on the domestic economy in the sense that import of quality goods may create some competitive pressure on the domestic farms and in the process, the product quality and the efficiency of the domestic enterprises may also improve. So, the contemporary theories and discussions also recognize the fact that imports are not necessarily harmful. If we are talking about imports of raw materials, imports of capital goods, imports of technologies, that may favor production process subsequently. That may facilitate production process subsequently. If we are talking about import of even final goods, that may cause some kind of spillover effect on the domestic farms, and domestic farms may go for 
improving the quality of their product, improving their efficiency to compete in the market effectively. So, in many cases, people discuss about competition from imports. And as I said, all imports may not be necessarily harmful for income. Yes, some such changes have taken place in the discussions, in the theories. These are basically the improvements in the existing theories with reference to Arthasastra. But again, there are some uh, common notions, common aspects where we see large degree of relevance of what was pointed out in Arthasastra and what we see, as I said, in contemporary theories and discussions. Now, as far as deciding the rate of interest, in many cases, it used to be decided by the central bank. But Arthasastra focused on two aspects. Risks involved and productivity of capital. We see in, in today's context, rate of interest varies depending on the purpose for which the loan is taken. We see some exemptions and similar exemptions were mentioned in Arthasastra also. I just bring in the last component, what would be very, very important for discussions, is basically the idea of surplus budget. Arthasastra pointed out about surplus budget. Basically, surplus budget was mentioned to avoid the crisis. But if we see the contemporary discussions, in many cases, even deficit budgets are also recommended for, particularly when Budget deficit is there and the rate of growth can be higher as compared to the rate of interest on borrowings. In many cases, it is pointed out that initially deficit budget would be very, very important to accelerate the growth of the economy. And as the economy grows, surplus would be generated government's tax revenue will increase and in the process the budget deficit may be avoided and we can move towards surplus budget so where orthosastra pointed out about surplus budget to avoid crisis the possibility of deficit budget is not ruled out in today's context. But what is very, very important in both the cases, what we see is basically rationalization of public expenditure. Arthasastra also raised concern about some such rationalization and emphasizing on certain core areas where public expenditure can be made and as it is pointed out here you can see it has pointed out that aggregate waste bill shouldn't exceed one fourth of the total revenue of the government these are some of the concerns regarding public expenditure that are pointed out in Arthasastra. 
and in in today's context also we talk about rationalization of public expenditure and the system of efficient audit to prevent various economic offenses so these are some of the aspects some of the insights from arthashastra what we can link to the contemporary discussions of course again there are certain differences certain changes certain deviations we can see in contemporary world but such insights are very very important to understand the contemporary theories and policies in a better way because these these insights give the perspective the philosophy behind and we can try for linking these insights to what we discussed today in economics i stop here and if you have any question you can ask me hello hello Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes sir, we can, yes, sir. we can hear you. So, do you have any question? Hello. Sir, I have. Ha, huh, please. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh. Sir, the uh, discussion of the tax structure today and how the economy is shaped based on Arthashastra, Shastra, I mean, that's a part of my thesis also, sir. Uh, I have been uh, uh, looking and studying in great detail, but I find that there are uh, a lot of differences because uh, in Arthashastra, Shastra, everything is primarily dependent on the decision of the king. And uh, when we compare it to today, everything is uh, dependent on the uh, the cabinet uh, and the discussion in the parliament and then something some bill or maybe a revenue uh, a tax revenue or something is passed so my concern is uh, when you talking about ardha shastra like literally today there is so much of uh, evolution in terms of uh, uh, designing or uh, working towards macro or micro economics so how relevant is uh, uh, I know you will say ki Sara lecture sunke you are asking me the same question, but how relevant is Arthashastra? Shastra? I mean, literally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah very good question, in fact. Uh, see, uh, what uh, we discussed today, we are not saying that what we practice today, everything is based on Arthashastra or in the line of Arthashastra. What basically we are trying to uh, bring out here some common points, some common references, what we have seen in Arthashastra and what we are seeing in contemporary, uh, say, tax structure, the reference that you are bringing in. Now, let me tell you uh, the differences that you are talking about. In Arthashastra, it was also pointed out that the king should have the limited power. Limited power means in the sense that the king shouldn't impose. The king means I'm talking about the state. The state shouldn't impose the tax arbitrarily. It should be based on discussions in respect of demand, supply, etc. So Arthashastra also recognizes the role of demand, the role of supply, right? the market scenario in the process ability of people to pay because when tax is imposed price of the commodity will go up and it will cause some sort of distortion in the market and then people's affordability is also a matter of concern otherwise people may not have access to those goods and services. 
so arthashastra talks about the ability to pay principle and if you see the contemporary principles of taxation that we discuss here also we talk about ability to pay and as i pointed out here in addition we talk about willingness to pay now what you are talking about the discussions in the parliament etc let us assume that here the government means i mean we can we can see uh, the king the way king used to function uh, uh, in those days if we just bring in that sort of uh, reference i think uh, we'll be missing out one point is that yes here there are scopes for debates and discussions and finally the tax rate is decided and we may assume that in many cases some such discussions will also reflect people's willingness to pay people's ability to pay people's concerns so the process has changed from that point of view i agree to you the process of deciding the tax rate has changed the process of deciding the tax structure has changed partly the principle the basic philosophy of taxation has also changed but again there is a common point between the two and the common point is basically the principle of ability to pay because arthashastra also recognized the fact that the tax structure shouldn't be the tax rate shouldn't be burdensome second point is the adverse consequences of the high rate of tax in arthashastra also it was recognized that high rate of tax would cause adverse impact on economic activities it may also lead to evasion of paying the tax now in arthashastra it was recommended that the tax rate should be somewhere around 16 to 20% of economic activities i pointed out the basic concept of lafarca when it was discussed how high rate of tax can result in lower tax revenue of the government so i am trying to see the link the common point from some such perspectives yes i agree to you the process of taxation has changed the tax structure has also changed like say for example at one point of time we used to pay sales tax we used to pay service tax now we are paying gst the tax structure has definitely changed but what about the basic notion that it shouldn't be burdensome it should be equitable it should uh, it should be based on ability to pay of course as i said i mean today also we are talking about willingness to pay in addition to ability to pay so these basic notions still remain the other aspect is basically high rate of tax on harmful goods and services again that is another common point Third, basically the policy of import substitution. What we have seen, even in Indian context for long, Arthashastra also talked about high rate of tax on imported luxurious goods, so that domestic production is encouraged. So. i'm not saying that today's tax structure is completely a replication of what arthashastra talked about i'm basically trying to draw certain commonalities certain common references certain common notions between the two structures now having said that 
we can always talk about certain differences. And those differences are because of contemporary developments, because of continuous evolution in various theories, concepts, like say import. Probably uh, uh, hardly uh, 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 people used to talk about the positive consequences of imports of final goods. Yes, the positive implications of import of capital goods, technologies, raw materials that were recognized long back. But with economic reforms, reforming the markets, liberalization process, it was realized that import of final goods, quality final goods can also cause some positive spillover impact on the domestic economy. It can create some competitive pressure on the domestic farms and in the process the domestic farms may be forced to improve the quality of their product and their efficiency. So, Again, if we talk about this import in particular, we see the differences. Arthasastra talked about restricting imports. And in today's context, there are discussions, there are papers where uh, people talk about import of final goods in certain areas that may cause some positive spillover. But as far as taxation is concerned, again, I'm getting back to that question that you raised, the process of fixing tax has changed. The tax structure has changed. Like uh, moving, moving from say sales tax to GST, service tax to GST. Then in GST we have different slabs. That GST tax, GST rate has also evolved over the period of time through various changes. So these changes are quite obvious because the context is changing, the perspective is changing, many theories have evolved over the period of time. So suppose a particular tax structure is implemented, then the consequences are analyzed and then it is fine tuned. Fine tuning is always a part of the policies, the, the process of policy formulation. But what about the basic notions? As far as the basic notion is concerned, we see certain common points, certain references. And I'm basically pointing out those differences, recognizing the fact that there are many differences. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Quite, quite, quite clear. Quite. Yeah, I'm not saying that it is entirely a replication. I'm basically saying the common points between Orthosastra and say today's tax structure. I don't know uh, if you have studied the theories of taxes and I would suggest you to see any book on public finance because you are doing your PhD in this line. You see any book on public finance and then you can go through the principle of ability to pay, willingness to pay, etc. Like say equity I am talking about. In Orthosastra, it is said that the tax structure should be equitable. And when we talk about taxes and today, we talk about horizontal equity and vertical equity. Right. So, uh, like say uh, horizontal equity. If two individuals are earning the same amount of income, they should pay the same amount of tax. Vertical equity. As we are more, we should pay proportionately more tax. And definitely uh, you know that the 
tax rate is different for different levels of income. But again, sir, uh, uh, one one small yeah, question, one last question. Uh, when uh, we are actually uh, talking about uh, tax, you have uh, mentioned in particular the ability to pay tax also is very important, which was a comparison which you made between Ardha Shastra and today's taxing policy. This, what this, is the common, this is the common point. The difference is willingness to pay. Yes, sir. My point here is, did uh, Ardha Shastra also consider the value of inflation at that time uh, that we uh, currently uh, consider it during our taxation uh, pro policies and implementation or was inflation uh, uh, not a very relevant factor? at that time it's no, no, just no, that a, part was not uh, that part was not uh, adequately discussed because it was just recommended that the tax rate should be somewhere around 16 to 20 percent and uh, probably uh, that inflationary component because because uh, that time in many cases the uh, the exchange the mode of exchange used to be different you know basically the butter system used to take place isn't it so the mode of exchange used to be different at that point of time as compared to currency based uh, transactions what we have today. So probably there is not much difference in, in respect of what you are talking about. Basically looking at the inflationary situation and then standardization of uh, taxes and etc. Right. Because probably that part was not probably that part was not that relevant at that point of time. That but comes the, international trade, I believe. Sorry. The, the concept of inflation, sir, comes in relation to international trade, which is more frequent now. No, even in case of, uh, uh, yeah, that is definitely uh, because the currency, uh, the exchange rate changes, etc. These are there, uh, but at the same time, the mode of transaction has changed. With currency system, the mode of transaction has changed. But one thing, Orthosastra recognized the fact that prices shouldn't be fixed arbitrarily. It should be fixed in relation to demand and supply. Because if prices are fixed arbitrarily, then it would cause some kind of deviation from the equilibrium and it may not necessarily maximize welfare. That's a very, very important point, actually. If you see the notion of parity optimality, there we discuss that all the conditions of parity optimality would be satisfied if there is perfect competition in the market. And in a perfectly competitive market, price is determined through interaction between the demand and supply, where the demand curve intersects the supply curve there actually the equilibrium takes place and correspondingly the equilibrium price and quantity are decided. So very important point here is that Orthosastra also recognizes the issue of limited resources and unlimited ones. And that's what is very important. Because if there is unlimited resource base, then uh, the, the economic, the discussion in economics doesn't become so relevant. Because we have resource constraint, at the same time we have unlimited wants, and the ones are competing in nature. So government has two, two basic roles to play. Allocation of resources. And distribution of goods and services. So that welfare is maximized. And subsequent discussions what we carry out. We can say that they basically are linked. All those discussions are basically linked to this broader objective of welfare maximize. Now question is whether it should be decided by the state, whether it should be decided by the market or a combination of that. 
if we see orthoshastra orthoshastra recognize the coexistence of both in today's context also we talk about the coexistence of both private enterprises and government sector so some common reference points are there but again the broader framework has changed as you have rightly pointed out any other question hello any other question so i don't have any questions anymore someone else can ask anyone any other question uh, sir this is shalini here yeah uh, sir act, uh, in the starting we discussed like there were three major economic activities like the agriculture husbandry and trade and uh, recently i have read that uh, in the current economic aspect like there is a, a scale of uh, area which defines the type of like different type of uh, pricing structure and all like the uh, least cost uh, theory or similar theory so was there any similar theory during the earth no, 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 no. what i said in the slide is basically the major economic activities that were discussed in arthashastra yes sir uh, uh, basically in relation to agriculture animal husbandry uh, trade etc yes now sir. if we talk about uh, today's structure of an economy economy is broadly divided into three sectors primary sector secondary sector and tertiary sector in primary sector the basic the main economic activity is agricultural and allied activities are you getting my point uh, in primary sector when we talk about primary sector the main activities are relating to agriculture and allied segments in case of secondary sector again it is mainly related to industry and in tertiary sector it is basically related to services and when we talk about the development process with development of an economy there is a shift we basically move from primary sector the focus basically shifts from primary sector to secondary sector to tertiary sector are you getting my point yes sir when an economy is at the very initial stage of development majority of people are engaged in primary sector a large part of the income comes from primary sector then as the economy grows the secondary sector expands and then people slowly switch over from primary sector to secondary sector share of the secondary sector in income increases similarly as the economy grows further we switch over from secondary sector to tertiary sector so this is basically the path of development are you getting yes. my point yes sir so what you are talking about is basically the wider domains of economic activities yes that has taken place like say industry if i say industry there are many segments in industry itself like manufacturing like say uh, trade um, uh, gas water supply there are there are various components if you see the composition of uh, uh, industry sector uh, sorry uh, yeah industry sector yes Hello, sir yes yeah. sir yes Yes, sir, I understood your point. Thank you, sir. Another question. Any other question? Yeah. 
if you don't have any other questions should we stop now and what i'll do i'll upload this uh, presentation so you can have a look at it and if you have uh, any further question you can write back to me or if we have that common session we can discuss in that session okay sir okay okay thank you thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you so i'll stop now